hour talk on my Latte Panda project. I say a uh, 15 minute <laughs> talk. Uh, so, who am I? I'm a uh, software engineer with uh, and I've got experience in uh, numerous programming languages, uh, including more recently uh, Python and Elixir. And I've also uh, got a uh, experience as a system administrator. So today I'll be uh, talking about, uh, I'll giving a uh, brief introduction about what I'll be talking about. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the uh, Latte Panda cluster, which I've got. And I'll be giving a, a summary at the end as to uh, the results and uh, what I hope to achieve in the future. So why? Uh, I don't drink coffee and I don't live in a country with uh, pandas. So why am I interested in uh, latte sipping pandas? Uh, and why do I call it a cluster of pandas? I did a uh, Google search previously and uh, found, I should uh, say, an embarrassment of pandas or a cupboard of pandas, believe it or not. But let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a keen Jedi. Oh, sorry, I misread that. Once upon a time, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a keen photographer. I will call him Brian. He had a digital camera. He took many, many, many photos. So many photos, in fact, that he needed a database system to store and search through the photos. Unfortunately, there were way too many photos to upload to the cloud because ADSL was just too slow. So he created an open source photo database written in Python to Django. As Brian is a keen developer, soon he had other applications. He needed some way of uh, deploying these applications in a reliable manner on his computers with uh, minimal overheads, as he didn't want to uh, spend more time on the uh, deployment solution than he has actually had to develop the applications. On my first attempt, I created a Debian repository that contained all the uh, required Debian packages, and I installed the Debian package on a uh, working Debian server system. Unfortunately, I realized I'd been spending more time trying to maintain the Python packages and dependencies in Debian than actually developing the uh, software that I wanted to develop. And I started to grow more and more concerned about the possibility that I'd upgrade a uh, Debian package in the uh, repository and I'd uh, break things. Either with the app photo database application or some part of the system that, re that depended on that uh, dependency or some other application entirely. And uh, if I had upgraded such a dependency and it broke, it wouldn't be easy to fix such a problem. Right, our next attempt was to uh, create a Docker image and have it automatically deploy using a, a systemd unit file. This worked, but was not very flexible. Uh, things which you like to uh, have in such a solution, such as automatic scaling, etc., etc., just not available. And I also had to remember to update each Docker container manually after I'd uh, updated the image. And this resulted in downtime also while doing the update, as it uh, has to uh, download the new image or rather it, has to, it typically shuts down the server, shuts down the Docker image, then it does the uh, download, and then it restarts it, and there's a bit of downtime while it's trying to download the image over ADSL. So for the last approach, I have a cluster of six latte pandas, and I uh, reserve three of them to use as a Kubernetes cluster. So what is a latte panda? Well, a latte panda is like a Raspberry Pi. It's a complete Linux system, as I uh, have installed uh, Linux on uh, mine. Uh, but it's a uh, Intel instruction set. And this is important for Docker because uh, many images 
uh, require uh, in Intel instruction set. And there are images that uh, support ARM, but uh, they're harder to find, and uh, I'm not sure how good they are. So I needed some sort of enclosure to put all these latte pandas in. Plus, uh, this enclosure needs to have cooling because I was worried about how much heat these uh, Intel Atom processors might use. So I've designed my own box with uh, cooling fans and uh, hopefully it won't overheat even on uh, hot days. And uh, the laser cut design is available on uh, my GitHub, which is a uh, LibraCAD file. So it was a, it's a work in progress. I, designing such a thing is a very much an iterative process and I could uh, keep further improving it, but I got to the stage where it was working as required, so I stopped at that point. So this is a uh, photo. I'm not sure how easy it is to uh, see, but uh, the top left corner is a uh, column of three latte pandas. Same with the uh, top right-hand corner is another row of three uh, latte pandas, and there's cooling fans next to them. And uh, at the uh, bottom left, there's a 10-port USB hub, powered USB hub to uh, power them all. So, it works. <laughs> when I uh, push a Git update, it automatically runs the CI tests, it creates a new Docker image, and then it deploys that image to the Kubernetes cluster. Wow. <laughs> so at the moment, I've uh, got a number of different applications running on it. Uh, some of these applications are third-party applications like a cert manager and to uh, automatically create certificates so I can run HTTPS. And uh, for bottom, sorry. And for bottom three, Applications are applications that I've designed. Yes, Bud is the uh, photo database. PhoneDB is a uh, application I've done that uh, my free switch instance talks to uh, to uh, record incoming phone calls and apply a uh, whitelist to the incoming phone numbers to block phone numbers that are routinely calling for telemarketing purposes. And uh, Robotica is another application I've designed, which I gave a, a talk in LCA 2018, I think, on an earlier version of Robotica. So IPv6 was one of the uh, issues that I had with Kubernetes. Initially, I tried an IPv6-only setup, and I was uh, happy with the uh, Kubernetes running in IPv6 until I found that many of the uh, third-party applications I wanted uh, did not work in IPv6 and uh, hard-coded to use IPv4. Uh, more recently, Kubernetes has uh, native dual stack support, which I've tried, but uh, so far I keep getting uh, segmentation faults from uh, node proxy at the uh, present stage. So I'll keep trying that as uh, they keep producing more releases of uh, Kubernetes, but so far <coughs> that is not quite working. And it could be that I've got something wrong in the uh, configuration and uh, it's failing because there's an error in my configuration. Unfortunately, I've tried everything I can think of that uh, I might have got wrong and uh, segmentation fault is not really helpful. <laughs> So, updates. Kubernetes has a constant stream of updates. So instead of maintaining uh, Debian packages, I now use my development time to uh, regularly update Kubernetes to the latest version. I'm not quite sure if this was uh, entirely successful. And I've also noticed a problem when uh, doing an update on the node, 
it requires failing OFE if the uh, processes to the other node. And I found when I do so, the uh, second node doesn't always start the processes correctly. And I haven't quite worked out why. Because when I uh, continue with the uh, last step of the uh, update, it requires moving all the uh, processes back to the first node. And then it suddenly works again. <laughs> Which isn't really, it's annoying because now I don't get the chance to debug the problem because it's working again. I think I'll have to spend some more time trying to work out what's going on there. And it could just be that it's uh, having problems downloading for images over the ADSL connection. So I'm also monitoring. We've uh, experimented. That's what I, yeah, downloading the Docker images is slow because we've only got uh, slow ADSL. Hence, it really helps to uh, build images on cloud servers where possible because uploading images is even slower. So now, monitoring. It should be easy, and I've uh, experimented with a uh, Helm repository for that monitoring application. Generally, most things work. However, I've noticed some services don't entirely work correctly. For example, uh, it, uh, it seems to assume that uh, ECTO seems to be contactable via HTTP, but uh, in the latest Kubernetes, it requires HTTPS, so that isn't working quite correctly at the moment. And uh, I just need some time to fix some of these issues. So, some ideas for the future. I need to actually read what the monitoring is recording for the uh, temperature of the uh, CPUs to make sure it's not uh, getting too hot. I need to uh, fix IPv6. I need to uh, have fix the problems with the deploys. And uh, ideally, I need to uh, have some solution which I have yet to uh, work out on uh, providing persistent storage for applications that need persistent storage and uh, Postgres MySQL database. So I've talked about uh, why I've implemented this, uh, the current design and uh, future ideas. Yes. Unfortunately, there is only one of me. I don't have cloning technology. Assistance from outsiders to improve on the code base would be appreciated. Yep. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to have some lightning talks now, but um, just while Brian is grabbing his laptop off, just, just wanted to mention that at my very first LCA in 2002, Brian was the very first person I ever spoke to in the LCA community. And it was um, breakfast of the first day. And um, I walked up to him and said, hi, I'm John. Like, what are you doing here? What are you interested in? And he said, hi, my name's Brian. I'm doing my PhD on scalability of the global public key infrastructure. Um, and that's why I've had imposter syndrome ever since. <laughs> So who is our first lightning speaker? You can MC. I might just run through the list so that our delightful speakers who have volunteered and been voluntold uh, know when you're coming up. Uh, first up, we're going to have uh, Brett from the Ballarat Hackerspace talking about projects that did and didn't work. Uh, then we'll have Jill with her plans for rovers. Uh, then John gets to actually talk for you know a few more minutes just other than introing people on Mickel Make It. Uh, Alistair is going to talk to us about phantom power drains on the Tesla. Uh, George is going to talk to us about an IoT comms library. And then Leon's going to give us a quick uh, demo and introduction to his awesome hugger lanyard. So, uh, Brett. We're just going to use this rather than trying to attach everybody to a lanyard. So hold it up and talk into it. And I am going to be making sure you stick to the time. Otherwise, we're going to run out and everybody wants to know what we're going to be doing. Do we have the screen? 
Yes? Yeah. Plug it in. Okay. One, do, do one thing with your hands at a time. Okay. I like that. <laughs> Otherwise, you're the kind of person who'd stick a soldering iron in my eye while you weren't watching. <laughs> hey. I give you Brett. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name's Brett. Um, Supproach is the tag thing. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, I help run a hackerspace. What projects we have that worked and what kind of, you know, didn't and crashed and burned and let out some magic blue smoke. Um, so again, Bellow Hackerspace, we're down there a little bit, down in Victoria. Um, we have a lot of fun running projects, but a big thing we run into is we have to... We've got big, crazy projects that we love doing over a long time, but the thing that we really like doing as well, too, is for new users, like, what's projects that we can do out there for them that can be done ideally in a day, has a low barrier of entry for them to get into, and also can be a low cost, so we can make a bunch of them, so we can have a bunch of people working on the same project at the same time. Um, so let's go through some of those projects. So one here we had is the LED... Uh, soldering project. So we, again, this is very simple. It's you've got a couple of LEDs there, solder them in, and some resistors. And on the other side is a um, coin cell battery. Um, so there's been variations of this kind of project. I think um, CCHS have a really good um, rocket um, variation of this kind of thing. Um, it's been very good because we can buy this in a kit, and it's typically about about ten dollars, ten fifteen dollars, including shipping. You can buy a bunch of them, and if someone comes into the space and they're like, and they've become a member, and they're like, "Oh, I'd really like to learn soldering," you can um, hand them this project and show them, give them some instructions and stuff, and they're good to go. And it's a very good sort of team or group project. So we um, we had um, an operation there where it's very easy to get a, a like um, put up an event and have people go in there. Go, it's an intro to soldering, and we've had probably 10, 20 people go through this thing, and they love it. It's really collaborative. Um, we have, this is the second part of it, the first half hour is actually, they don't do any soldering at all. It's, it's the, they're cutting up pieces of wire and making like a little hangman and putting them together and soldering them together. And that, that's just so they can get used to putting and connecting bits together without going, oh, I'm going to burn up the, and break the PCB board. So it helps get them um, less scared about it. Um, things that didn't work, this thing. So I was like, all right, what about 201 project? So we'll, we'll go do that. And the thing I was thinking of this is like, um, when we looked at the um, Tindy page for doing this, it was like, all right, you've got, give this to someone and don't show them what it is going to be beforehand. And the goal is that they've got 10 minutes to do it. See how far they can get. And that's their benchmark. So did they get to the, uh, the 0201 level or where did they um, stop at? So it was sort of like a benchmark kind of thing. It was, it was funny, but literally no one brought it or went for it. So that crashed. Um, next up, we had this um, project where it was, it was like a we're really excited about, it and all of, all the committee got behind it. Was like it was a beacon, so there's a little WeMOS at the bottom, piece of board at the top. We found some LEDs and a button that you could press. So we had a little um, uh, 3D printed board that you can press on top of it, and it, you could have hook it up in anything. Like it could be the button's going to flash green if the weather's good, or if bin day is going to be just your recycling bins, it could flash to the relevant colour for that kind of thing. Um, and we we're pretty hyped about it. Put a lot of effort into it. Had an instruction manual to get up to installing the firmware and all that kind of thing. Um, two people used it in the end. And we, we probably spent a couple of months getting up to that stage. So it felt like it was a little bit of burnout there. But I think the takeaways we got from that was that getting to the point where you've installed the software and you've ran Hello World, we didn't really have anywhere for the users to go, right, well, how do I run software after that kind of thing? So they dropped off interest with that really quickly. And I feel like that's a really common recurring pattern with projects. You've got, you've got to have some kind of way of going, all right, what's Hello World plus one? Like, how do you get them interested after that kind of thing? And I think that was the biggest learning I had for that kind of project there. Um, other thing here is um, coffee coasters. So what would happen here is I would have a template, and th this is, again, a really tr cheap and quick project to do, is um, have a really long board, and I've already got the template of creating the outline there, and then I tell the users, go, all right, give me a picture inside this um, line, 
and we'll show you how to use your laser cutter soft or our laser cutter software to burn that on there to make their own coffee cup coaster. I'll wrap it up in a sec. That that was that was heaps of fun. We also repurposed it for awards at the end of the uh, Christmas party. So we um, had awards for like you know best project or people who correct finished the most um projects, which um you know that's a hard thing at the hacker space is actually finishing projects. Anyway, it was all good fun. Thanks everyone. Have a good one. Thank you, Brett. Next up, we have Jill. So earlier today, those of us who were participating in uh, the assembly project were uh, working on donkey cars, but because we're down under and we've got modifications, they're dingo cars. Uh, Jill has got some plans. What do you normally call a dog, you know, or a dingo? Rover. Guess what she wants to uh, do next. Now, that is a Land Rover. That, that is a Land Rover. It was built in 1966. They didn't have much electronics then. In fact, the electronics they did had probably wouldn't go in a car because it'd fall apart because it was probably vacuum tubes or something. Um, this was a paddock find and a group of us negotiated to buy three for a certain price. Uh, I bought this one. It was made by Land Rover in Australia for the Australian Army. So the army eventually sold it in 1985 to a person who did one or two things with it, probably put the canopy on it, because I think the original didn't have a canopy. But it does have an engine, and the engine was known to make a noise. So I know it's not seized. So there it is being taken back to our farm. And that's the dashboard that you get. Um, you'll notice a certain lack of anything. Um, there's, a <laughs> there's a gear shift lever which might confuse some young people. In fact, there's two gear shift levers. Um, you'll see some knobs at the top uh, below the windscreen. That's the air conditioner. Um, when you, when you <laughs> pull those knobs up, it opens some flaps at the front which lets air into the cabin. Um, the other gauges are probably mostly self-explanatory. And yes, it has a steering wheel. It does not have a seat at the moment. or The seats that it has are somewhat poor. That's an engine. Uh, it's a normally aspirated four-cylinder petrol engine with a uh, drum roll. Lucas Parts. <laughs> Those that have seen Lucas Parts may possibly weep. But the the gizmo on the right-hand side is um, a carburetor. Um, the big cylinder is an air cleaner. The, the massive mess in there is what Lucas used for wiring. And as you see, it has a radiator. And what I'd really like to do is measure the temperature on the radiator... It does actually have a gauge for temperature, but I haven't figured out wh where the sensor is actually connected. Um, it is on the core somewhere, but it's not necessarily sensible. I would love to know whether um, the uh, spark is getting to the spark plugs. I would love to know whether there's air coming into the engine and if there's fuel. At the moment, the, um, the fuel is questionable. It's got two fuel tanks. It's got a switch over from one to the other, uh, missing the right-hand fuel tank. And instead of having a fuel tank cover, it's got a Vegemite jam jar or something. Lid. On the left-hand side, it's got a fuel lid. So that would be an interesting thing. All, a lot of that's got to be replaced. But and some of the sensors, like things like tyre pressure gauges, you can get those. You can go and buy a tyre pressure gauge fits to the tyres, and yes, it will probably work. 
But on a really old car like this, you don't really want to put things in the engine. You want to try and attach things. So part of my project is going to be how do I attach things to this really ancient piece of equipment um, where I know that the engine will probably go. Um, I may stick with the Lucas parts, but I would like to supplement a lot of instrumentation so that when one is tuning the car, you know that the uh, position of the um, uh, fan belt, for instance, is correct with respect to the timing it's supposed to be. Uh, maybe one puts a dot on there and puts a, a sensor that measures the, the dot is at what position with respect to whatever the timing is doing. So little things like that would be like, nice to have. And as you can see, there's a huge amount of room in that engine bay, uh, so much so that on this picture here, you can see that I'm almost falling into the engine bay having a, <laughs> having a look at the thing. <laughs> there's a lot of room at the back there. You can see where the spare tyre is. Um, and, um, yeah, so that's where the story is. It's um, um, my situation at the moment is I'm pulling the engine, part of the engine apart and I'm replacing mechanical things, learning about AF spanners and funny, funny shapes. There's nothing metric on it. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, um, a, a real car, a real end is to get the thing on the road with club registration and we'll see how much electronics can be added without totally ruining it. Thank you. I love the way you can take something old like that and stick on modern technology to make it better. Now we've got John telling us about Mickle Make It. I don't even know what this is, but it'll be awesome because it's John. No pressure. Don't judge too soon. This is Mickle Make It, which is my open source pick and place machine. This is what it looked like uh, about five years ago, which is about the last time that I did a talk about it. Since then, it's been massively rebuilt. So this is closer to what it looks like now. This was while I was rebuilding some of the parts feeders. The whole frame has been... Uh, reassembled so it's much higher. If you don't know, just to make it easier to understand what's going on, there are a bunch of different parts here. The objective with this machine is to take very small surface mount parts and place them accurately onto a circuit board in a repeatable way. So down the bottom there you can see a reel of parts. The target PCB is sitting up here, that's where they need to get to. Uh, these devices are feeders which um, move the tape and expose the next part that needs to be placed. There's a controller down here which uh, controls the feeders and moves them into the right position. There's a camera mounted here, a little hole you can see in the base plate. There's a fixed camera looking straight up. There is also a camera looking down on the head. So we've got a bottom camera and top camera. And here there is a little vacuum nozzle which is used to pick up the parts. And um, that's a different view of the head so that you can see what's going on. You can see the camera mounted down there on the left. It's just a USB webcam that's been pulled out of its case and attached to a little 3D printed bracket. And then a vacuum nozzle beside it with the green tip. So that vacuum nozzle is off a Juki pick and place machine, uh, which is a very expensive commercial machine. They make high-end stuff. So if you want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a pick and place machine, you can go to companies like Yamaha or Juki or whoever. And it's very common for open source or DIY pick and place machines to use some of the commercial parts from those high-end machines because they're very good quality and it's very easy to get second source replacement parts. The, um, the actual assembly you can see there, the black uh, section just above the green nozzle is a stepper motor with a hollow shaft. And the reason for that is that there is a vacuum fitting onto the back of the shaft where the little grey fitting is. You can see the hoses, which are actually just aquarium hoses. And the nozzle is spring-loaded and it's also hollow. So what we have is a vacuum feed going all the way through the middle of the motor and then the motor can rotate to... Uh, put the correct angle on the parts that it's putting down. So this is actually running a pick up a pick and place job for making the dingo car boards. This is someone's board this morning was this job that we're about to see here. So this is the software that runs it, which is OpenPNP. On the left, you can see the downward-looking camera. 
it's looking at something, there's some sticker on the board, and the list that you see on the right-hand side of the screen are all of the placements that it's going to do in this particular job. So we'll just let the, um, the video run. Unfortunately, it's kind of annoyingly loud. It's got the, uh, you can hear the servos, uh, the solenoids for the vacuum pickup. And what it's doing is moving the head to the correct position and use, firing the solenoid to activate the vacuum, uh, picking up the part, moving it into position, putting it down, and then going back for the next one. You can hear the feeders that are, uh, and you should be able to see it. The, um, the first feeder moves the next part into position. And as it's moving forward, it peels back the tape to expose the next part. You can see here that the head is moving directly between the feeder and the destination. So this is running in a, an open loop uh, setup. So it's not actually checking the orientation of the parts or anything. It's just blindly going to the location and putting them down. In a moment, it'll move on to some more parts and you'll see that it will take them via the bottom camera and what it does is move the part over the camera which is in a very accurately known position takes a photo the photo then goes through an open CV pipeline and it detects the, um, the position of the part because it may have a slight misorientation or not quite be in the right position on the nozzle it then applies an on-the-fly correction to the position of the part and then moves it and puts it down on the PCB you can see there that it's doing the inspection. So running with the, uh, the bottom camera makes it take about twice as long to put each part down, but it means that you get more accurate placements. I often just stand here and stand there and watch it while it's running because it's so cool. <laughs> it's almost done. <laughs> No, this, um, this job was about 2 minutes 40 seconds, I think. Um, that, this is not all the parts on the board. This is just the jelly bean parts, the, um, the common capacitors and resistors and things. And then the, uh, the more exotic parts, like the little QFNs and things, I put all of those on with a pair of tweezers and a microscope. I think it's almost done. Okay. <laughs> Child labor laws. Yeah, the, um, the question was, why did I do some parts with the machine and some parts with tweezers and a microscope? Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. For, um, you can see the feeders on there only have a certain number of feeders, and there are more parts, more types of parts on the board than I have feeders. So what I did was optimize it, and the most common parts, um, there are a couple of values of capacitors and resistors that there were quite a few of the same value, those are the ones that are loaded in the feeders. And then the one-off parts, like a single uh, IC, that I, I just did that by hand because it's not worth trying to set up a feeder just for that one part. So it's a, um, an ROI sort of calculation. So that's it. Thank you. A small insight into what goes on behind the scenes. Alistair, we've got you next. Hello. So, um, hi, I'm Alistair. I work at Oz Labs. Um, I do home automation stuff in my spare time. And a few months back, my wife and I got ourselves a Tesla. Yay! Um, and uh, fast forward a month, and I was noticing that the battery was draining um, when the car was parked a lot faster than it should have been. And this is the little tale of why that happened. So, we do home automation at home, um, and of course we got a shiny new toy, and so the first thing I did was look and see if there was a way to integrate that with the home automation, and Tesla currently make an API, and someone built a home assistant module that allows the Tesla to talk to my home automation, which is great. So now my home automation knows where the car is, it can tell its battery charge, uh, control a bunch of things. Um, and so that was really nice. And then shortly thereafter, I added power management uh, to my home as well. So we've got a whole bunch of solar, um, and I'm tracking my surplus power budget, and that has, 
that goes through Home Assistant and then into Node Red, and that can decide which devices to turn on and off. And in particular, it turns on and off my air conditioning, um, which is nice because it means that uh, if the temperature is out of our comfortable range and there's surplus power, then the air conditioner will come on. I don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, and so, a little digging, I just happened to stumble across one of the Home Assistant logs that was complaining about the climate entity. And it turns out what I was doing in Node Red was passing commands to the climate entity to turn the climate control in the house on and off. And the actual entity field of that was uh, blank. Turned out I had made a mistake um, further in the pipeline um, and wasn't actually specifying the device in the right field. And instead of just throwing an error, the climate entity, when it gets a command to turn on and off, applies it to all climate entities. And the Tesla API kindly exports a climate entity for the air conditioning in the car. <laughs> and so what was going on was um, the house was going, oh, look, I've got lots of power. Let's turn on the air conditioning. And the car's going, OK, I'll just do that. <laughs> Doesn't matter that anyone was in there or not. Um, and so after making a rather small change to my Node-RED configuration, probably no more than about eight bytes worth of stuff, I no longer have a phantom power drain in my car. <laughs> so. <laughs> The robots really are trying to take over and steal all the power. Uh, George, with your IoT comms library. Tell us what you built and why. There's a loose cable. Yep. Are you having fun today? I'm having fun. I'm very new to this uh, open hardware experience. Andy wrote me in like three months ago and now he's never getting me out again. <laughs> All my children. Don't overthink it too much. We've got four minutes and one to go. Thanks for that. So hey, um, yeah, I quickly want to introduce that uh, IoT communications library I started creating a year ago. So um, the story behind it basically is I work for, an, for a company which uh, creates IoT uh, charge controllers. And we uh, had that uh, the problem IoT device needs to communi communicate with some, uh, some uh, server on the cloud somehow. And uh, as we couldn't find any uh, library that fulfilled all the requirements we had. So we decided uh, to create our own and uh, open source it. And this is what uh, came out, the uh, Cicada uh, module for energy access. So it's uh, basically a software module and a hardware module, which uh, contains all the basic parts that is uh, required to uh, connect uh, an IoT device and do some basic communication. So um, uh, let me check the, oh, this, the, the difficult here. Um, so this is the readme of the, of the uh, GitHub page. So it, uh, um, uh, one of the requirements to, uh, was to also uh, run on bare metal. So it contains some uh, basic uh, code like, uh, like a circular buffer and also a very basic scheduler. Um, there are a bunch of UART drivers, so a STM32 uh, UART driver. It also runs on top of embed, and uh, you can also combine it directly on Linux. So if you don't have a microcontroller, you can uh, develop directly on your host system. Um, we currently have support for two uh, cellular modems uh, from uh, uh, the famous Chinese ones, the SIM 800 and the SIM 7600. So what basically is happens, uh, the, you have these UR drivers, then you send a bunch of AT commands to these modems, and then it brings up a um, uh, TCP connection. And on top of that, you can use uh, the Power MQTT client uh, to send some MQTT comments. So um, that's it. So there's also a hardware part. Um, it's this one, which 
um, com, uh, contains, uh, contains some basic keycard files with uh, schematics for the two models I just mentioned. And uh, in the library, there are a bunch of examples. So uh, I can't see this from here, but it's, um, which example is that? Uh, yeah, this is uh, basically an example that just connects uh, to a web server and fetches a web page. So it's uh, pretty easy. You basically first open the art device, then you create your communications device, you open your uh, TCP connection, send, uh, uh, send this uh, HTTP request, and then you get the reply. Uh, re reply. Um, yeah, what's the current status of the library? So it's still a very early work in progress, uh, not very feature-rich yet. Um, but what we have is, is very stable, so we, we try to really unit test everything and uh, document everything and make it as stable as possible. And we hope to add some uh, more features in future like uh, Wi-Fi, uh, some other radio devices, and uh, probably even some uh, more basic uh, uh, features um, like... Uh, well, I already have a schedule about like uh, GPIO management and all that other microcontroller stuff. Yeah, so that's it. So if uh, someone is interested, uh, this is the GitHub link. Please have a look. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have got Leon and his awesome hugger badge. Um, I'm sure you've all got many more projects boiling around in your brains, as well as questions on some of the things that you have seen today. Uh, make use of that hallway track and hunt down people and ask them lots of questions because that's what we're all here for. That's the part of the reason that LCA is so great. We put like-minded people together and uh, give them a chance to talk in, in person uh, like real people, and you know, you get to have that real-time high bandwidth communication that lets you uh, share ideas and come up with great new cunning plans. Tell us your new cunning plan, Leon. Well, this is an old cunning plan. This is uh, iteration number four of the hug detecting badge, which started out as just an IR binary switch uh, and has since then used uh, a LiDAR sensor. Um, <laughs> I saw on uh, Crowd Supply that uh, the Tiny Pico was available to buy again, and then when I went to browse the web page, it turned out I had five of them. So <laughs> that's what I'm running this year. Uh, uh, it's a bit of an off cuff, but it's just a Tiny Pico, a LiDAR sensor, um, and an ADAR dot star strip um, that's tethered to my phone via Wi Fi. Um, and some really awful wiring on the back, and three Docker containers, an ECS instance. <laughs> um, <laughs> it does use uh, uh, um, Let's Encrypt certificates on the actual service, so it's secure. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, and what, what else can I say about it? Um, and cloud formation, because I don't like doing things by hand. <laughs> uh, if someone wants to give me a hug, uh, maybe it'll tweet straight away if I don't fall off the stage. Uh, it cost me about $3 uh, for the entire conference. And in theory, that should... Was that... I don't know. It, that was an hour ago. It's supposed to be live feeding. What? Let's, let's, have I got, what have I broken? I, it definitely worked, because I've got the notification. Clearly my hug was inadequate quality. That was an hour ago. Did it break? No, uh... <laughs> Maybe. I've got, the, I've got the notification on my phone that it worked. <laughs> Uh, they're live demos. They, they, they. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, no, one hour ago. I can actually see it um, if we go over to the logs of the. Where is my mouse over here? What possessed me to build this? What possessed me to build this? Um, I was kind of bored. Uh, Struggling a little bit with uh, social anxiety a few years ago. I don't have that problem so much now. And I wanted a way to shortcut socialising. 
and while getting lots of hugs, and I seem to find a fairly good hack for that. But <laughs> maybe if you hug me again, it might do something else. And there, there's, <laughs> it's, it's logging hugs, but maybe it's, I've bro been broken on Twitter, because that'd be the second or third time that's happened. The, the second year I got so many hugs, they shadow banned me, and I tried to work around that with random hug messages that you can see. The, that was an exceptional hugger. Um, uh, I will figure out what's going wrong with Twitter later. But that's me and my hug detector. Come and talk to me. <laughs> Open hardware, doing everything from, you know, giant old school Range Rovers to uh, helping people deal with their social anxiety. That is the end of the lightning talks and we're out of time. Um, thank you everybody who came and shared. Uh, we are now up into the wrapping up stage of the...